So it is 11.30 by my clock. So I think we will get started again. Welcome back everybody, all those of you who have made it back. Um, so now we move on to a different sort of session and uh, we're very lucky to have two speakers from the hearing device industry to talk to us for the next hour or at least to talk and fill the next hour with discussions. Um, so we have Carolina Smets from WS Audiology's uh, research group in Stockholm, and we have Stefan Petrausch from the research and development section of the same company in Erlangen to talk about real life listening through hearing aids, which is a very appropriate thing to be talking about at this point, as we've heard already this morning. Um, the issue of ecological validity has begun to come up, and uh, I am confident that the talks that we were going to get from Carolina and Stefan will help us to formulate some questions and discussions as to how to move forward with the next round of challenges uh, so as to move um, as much as possible in the right direction with the kinds of scenarios and the kinds of questions we are uh, asking of the systems that will be developed and uh, put into competition. So I think without further ado, I will ask Carolina to start her talk and she will hand over to Stefan at some point. We will take questions after both talks have been finished, uh, but of course you can Put questions in the Q and A at any point, and we will pick them up at the end um, and uh, see where the discussion takes us. So, Carolina, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present something here. Uh, I will start with talking about what we mean by real life listening, and then introduce one uh, real life listening situation, the group conversation. So, um, of course, hearing aids are used in real life. Uh, so, what do I mean by yet even talking about real life. Um, I will show you an example, uh, and it is an example from our own research because it's always a little bit more polite to not point fingers towards anyone else. So this is a, an example, and it's not unusual, so it's not us who just made this mistake. Uh, it was a study where we evaluated noise reduction algorithms, or rather predictive measures of speech recognition after noise reduction processing. And as part of that study, we measured what is called the speech reception threshold. And in this case, it meant that we, the test participants listened to speech in noise, and we determined the signal to noise ratio for 80% correctly identified words. And we did it for two groups of test participants, hearing impaired people and people with normal hearing. And what are the problems with this type of study? On average, there is a large difference in the speech re reception threshold between the normal hearing and the hearing impaired test participants. It's not strange because, of course, people with normal hearing can do with lower signal to noise ratios than people with hearing impairment. Uh, that is documented in study after study. Uh, there is also a large uh, difference between individuals with hearing impairments. You can see that there is a, a 10 dB range here, and it's even an outlier up here, which would increase the, uh, the range even further. So it's a big difference in the signal to noise ratios that people ended up with for 80% correct. And the problem is that we know that noise reduction algorithms do not function in the same way at different SNRs. So in practice, we have evaluated this these noise reduction systems under very different conditions. So then the follow-up questions for us were at which SNR should evaluations be made? And we tried to find some information about that. And a little bit broader, what is the auditory reality of people who will use our products? So uh, the ORCA team in Stockholm, uh, we have focused our research recently on the following areas. We want to learn about people's auditory reality, uh, and that incorporates the listening demands that people have in different situations, but also the environment, the auditory and the visual environment. And for instance, the single noise ratio is part of that. 
And we want to use the information we gain to incorporate the, when testing hearing aid features. We want to do testing that is indicative of real life performance. And as Graham already mentioned, uh, there has been a focus on ecological validity in testing some time now when we have contributed to the, those discussions. So I will say something about uh, some of our work within this area. So if we start with the auditory reality thing, uh, in 2015, we published a paper uh, called Estimation of Signal Noise Ratios in Realistic Sound Scenarios. And here we estimated the uh, signal to noise ratios based on some recordings that were made by satisfied hearing aid users. And we presented the uh, uh, SNA, SNR data uh, for different types of uh, background uh, noises. Um, and what we could see is that the uh, SNRs were generally positive, um, typically between five and 10 dB. I mean, there are limitations to the way we did this. So I think maybe in real life, there might be some more situations with lower SNRs, but uh, the minus 10 dB that we saw for normal hearing people in the uh, example I just showed is not very realistic. Uh, we also saw that many of the situations uh, had the same SNR, but were still judged to be uh, to differ in difficulty. So we wanted to learn more about the types of situations that people encounter in real life. So this study, uh, which is called the Common Sound Scenarios, that was uh, that was a, a literature study where we used information we found in audiological literature to sort of classify the situations that people encounter. So we have these intention categories, speech communication, focused listening, but not speaking yourself, and non-specific. And they were further divided into what we call task categories. Uh, and uh, we thought that was useful sort of in itself, but we have also used it when we have looked at outcome measurement development, which uh, is the second part. So we have used what is called ecological momentary assessments. And that is that you are using hearing aids connected to a smartphone with a reminder or prompting system. And then you fill out a questionnaire. And in our case, we have asked questions about people's auditory reality. What type of situation are you in? And test participants have indicated which of these cost task categories that they were in. And then we have asked follow-up questions related for instance, to which hearing aid program they preferred, and they have done sort of pair comparisons and stored the results in, in the cloud. But we have also worked on developing more realistic laboratory tests. And here is a situation where the uh, test participant and the test leader are talking, uh, and the test participant is changing programs to decide which one uh, he prefers. And uh, during the last a uh, couple of years, uh, we have focused these laboratory testings to uh, the group conversation situation uh, and the often mentioned cocktail party situation. I think my life is a little bit boring because there aren't that many cocktail parties, but uh, uh, being a group conversation uh, where it's slightly noisy it happens. So this is a situation where these two people are talking to each other. I don't know what's going on here, but it looks a little bit flirty. Um, but you can assume that there are at least four people talking in this situation uh, and um, they are talking in the background of other people at the same cocktail party. So some of the challenges for the cocktail party situation is of course to hear what is said, often in noise and the noise is often um, babble. It could also be music, but in a babble noise that masks the speech that you want to hear quite, quite well. You also need to both listen and speak. Uh, as compared to the laboratory tests that we are doing where you just repeat what is being said, that is not a success, uh, successful way to converse with people at cocktail parties, I can assure you. Uh, and you need to plan your speech while you are listening, which can be cognitively demanding. And you need to be able to identify the next talker. So first you can focus on a person, but then you also need to be able to identify the next talker. And that can be fairly subtle cues like breathing in or so. And there is lots of social pressure and conventions related to turn taking. How long can you wait until you start to answer a question? How often can you ask for repeats? But there are also some opportunities in real life. And that is that if you have information about the context, then you can predict or guess what is coming up more easily than in a speech test. You have the visual input for speech reading and also uh, understanding what is happening. You can ask for clarifying questions, ask clarifying questions or for repeats. 
Uh, and we have what is called back channeling, which can be verbal so that listeners are helping the speaker to show that they are following. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Uh, and it can also be nonverbal. So you can see that people are not following and then you might repeat yourself. And we also imply, employ some helpful behavior uh, like raising our voices, both the level and the pitch uh, when it's noisy. And we usually employ a slower speed uh, and take longer pauses in turn taking to help the situation. And yes, because we are so focused on outcome measures, I wanted to show you this slide, which is uh, quite messy, but you can just get a flavor for the different ways in which we can investigate group conversations. So something that we have done at Orca is that we stage a conversation and then I call it measure something else. So for instance, we have a, a conversation situations and then we ask people to perform pack comparisons uh, between two hearing aid programs or rate how well it's going. And I call that traditional psychoacoustical methods. Then we have the other cluster of, of ways to investigate uh, group conversations. I, I call that stage a conversation and analyze what is happening in that conversation. We can analyze the linguistic content. Uh, do people align? Do we have breakdown and repair? We can analyze the back channeling I talked about. We can also analyze acoustical parameters such as speech level, speech rate, utterance duration, speech proportion and turn taking timing. We can also analyze body movements, the body posture, where are people looking in the conversation? We can look at head movement, gestures, and if people start to coordinate the way they uh, behave. And we can look at electrophysiological correlates and their study focused attention, attention switching, attention drifting, effort prediction, and neural synchrony. So without going into any of details, you can see that there are various ways in which uh, these situations can be analyzed. And we are working on all of them except for the linguistic content. So to summarize, uh, testing indicative of real life performance has become more and more common. Uh, across the audiological community. So when it comes to testing in the laboratory, we are focusing on more realistic sound environments, for instance, the SNRs, more realistic tasks, for instance, the real conversations. And then we do testing in people's everyday life, the EMA I mentioned. And we are starting to think about how we can evaluate the degree of ecological validity in different types of studies. And for the group conversation, it is a difficult, important, not so commonly occurring, uh, but still a very difficult and important real life situation that is worth investigating. So with this really quick run through, I want to thank you for your attention and acknowledge some of my co-workers who have uh, participated in the work that I reported here. Thank you very much indeed, Carolina, for uh, opening our eyes to a different landscape than uh, what we've been focusing on so far. Stefan, do you want to take over and share your screen and carry on? Yes, I want. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Carolina, also from my side. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I hope you can now see my screen. That's good, yes. So I, I think uh, Carolina opened up the stage for what what we have when uh, for technical solutions in terms of challenges. Um, and this is where I'm trying to dig into deeper. I already heard pretty uh, interesting talks uh, in your Clarity Challenge, which are really very interesting. So that nowadays uh, is machine learning has turned out to be uh, the ideal method for almost everything potentially also for hearing aids. But in this context, I want to highlight you some, some challenges with, which will be important. And later on, I will also give several examples on, on how to deal with those challenges to uh, somehow bring the algorithm, the technical solution closer to real life. Um, something which is quite important, which was now also the highlighted by, by Carolina, that um, what, whatever we do, um, that the robustness is extremely important, but often it's really overlooked. Um, so um, nobody can control or predict what people are doing in, in real life. And the algorithm, the hearing aid has to work in any situation. And 
in, in any case, so all situations must result in a meaningful behavior. So there, there must not be a not foreseen case uh, because we are lacking our training data and suddenly some strange things happen and uh, your target speech gets distorted. Um, Potentially, there's also the case of misuse of the hearing instruments, or we actually had it in, in really some examples where people, it was possible that people could train the hearing aids, but you, you never can guarantee that uh, your, your customer, your the hearing aid wearer is doing it correctly. Um, and so also here in, in any case, the main hearing aid functionality has to stay in tune um, without any compromise, actually. Okay, <laughs> something also very important, but obviously often considered to be less important is sound quality. Um, and I also had it in, in Carolina's talk. So, um, so of course, first of all, you want to highlight your speech and target signal. So any sound artifacts uh, have to be avoided. I I know personally a lot of machine learning DNN applications um, for noise reductions, which are still having this kind of tiny little crackling, which is really not acceptable at all, um, at least not for a product. And often it's even more difficult that even noise or sounds considering to be uh, interfering noise, they still have to be audible. So you have to judge whether it's the fridge behind you or whether it's a vacuum cleaner. Um, it, it's, it is not an option to really reduce the noise in such a way that it's all gone. You still have to have the impression of your surrounding and you have to hear if a person is breathing uh, to start talking. Um, also something often hard to achieve is that the spatial impression has to be conserved. Okay, latency. I also heard in previous talks, five milliseconds, which was pretty okay. <laughs> uh, often, uh, but often um, the machine learning methods have uh, issues with the total latency. So this uh, total of 10 milliseconds is including really everything, uh, AD converters, DA converters, um, a filter bank if required. Often it's a high challenge and often really when you're bringing the, the algorithm down to a low latency, the performance uh, deteriorates a lot. Um, last but not least, computational complexity. Um, you know, the hearing aids are quite small. Power consumption is an issue. Currently we're all equipped with lithium ion, ion um, accumulators lasting one day. So, uh, the signal processing chip in a hearing aid should not consume more, usually more than one milliamp. Um, but as it's a custom made uh, ASIC, usually we have high computational power, but uh, potentially not sufficient to really make a complex DNN work. Okay. So I, I hope I have opened up the scene for the challenges in real life listening scenarios. I will try to make it more concrete by giving you some examples. Um, as I think you might be most interested in the last one, um, but anyhow, I will <laughs> step through. So to give you also an historical context and also how to deal with certain issues. Of course, the first and most easiest application of machine learning, which was already done, I think, uh, I have it written here, 2005, 2006, uh, that the manufacturers started reading acoustic classification, still based on classical machine learning methods. Um, the advantage of these methods is that um, you don't have a direct so what, what you're doing, you're classifying the acoustic scene and based on this classification, you are adjusting the other features, uh, the operation of the hearing aid in such a way that it's um, most best suited to the current situation. So you don't have a direct impact from the classification result to the sound. You still have the algorithm in the background, which will definitely ease potential misclassifications. 
Uh, latency is not so critical. You can assume that the acoustic situation where you're currently in, are you in a multi-talker conversation? Are you at home? Are you in front of your TV? Are you in a car? It should not change that fast. So um, delay, a certain delay is acceptable here. And of course we can um, use uh, classical methods and uh, use acoustic features and not directly work on the audio signal. Robustness is still an issue and is still an issue now. Um, because um, acoustic uh, situation detection may be false and it also may be misinterpreted. Uh, you see here three examples where you definitely have detected car, but in one case you want to listen to music and in the other case you want to hear your conversation partner and so on. So people are usually afraid of these misclassifications. I would call this the first level of um, machine learning because we also have a pre-trained system. So in the device itself, only the pre-trained system is running. So we don't need to train it online. Um, we have an indirect effect of the acoustic signal and we have slowly changing condi conditions. Um, here an example for potential architecture. What is important? So usually you have features, tonality, noise flow modulation and, and many more. Um, from these, uh, it's a, very good idea to do a binaural synchronization of your features to uh, increase robustness. Um, when you have either a classification or a regression system, a uh, regression system means that you are getting some kind of probability or belongingness to a certain class. Uh, so regression is much better suited here um, because usually you can have both. You can be in a car and still have speech. Um, Later on, there's another binary synchronization of a classification result. And then you have the um, control logic, which is controlling the algorithm, usually quite slow. So what is controlled? Directionality is controlled, of course, noise reduction, but also gains. And usually slowly fading, so it does not, uh, is it uh, observed as a hard switch. And classical methods, one example would be, for instance, Gaussian mixture models. <laughs> Hope you still know this technique. It's still really pretty convenient. Okay, coming to the next example. Um, getting more involved in application of machine learning methods, and it is actually a machine learning method, um, is to deal with your own voice uh, because um, own voice is usually perceived so for you as a normal hearing as the superposition of acoustic path and bone conduction path uh, you see it here and usually the bone conduction path is um, the dominating one it's also usually high in level but uh, what happens when you um, attach a hearing aid to the acoustic path uh, gets much louder and the relation uh, between um, acoustic path and bone conducting path is then disturbed and results in an unnatural perception of your own voice. So what can you do? And I had to include this figure because I really like this. I also like the toucans. Um, you can uh, resemble Vestipedios with legs. This means when you're talking your own, uh, there are certain uh, bones in your ear which are reducing the sensitivity of your ear itself. And this also holds for, for these birds especially. Um, so whenever you're talking, you're reducing the sensitivity and the hearing aid can do the same. And of course, what is in this scenario, the challenge, here we definitely have a latency challenge uh, because um, you have to detect your own voice immediately more or less. Um, you have a sound quality and spe speech instability challenge, so the external speaker ch speaker must not be modified. Um, yes, it has to be robust. It has to work independent from your own. Don't know if you have throat aching or if uh, if you're cold, then it still has to work, or if you're whispering, it should it still has to work. And of course, we have a challenge of computational cost. Um, so how did we deal with these challenges? So um, I would claim potentially you would even have a detection time less than 20 milliseconds. 
And here it's more or less impossible to really use um, spectral features and then detect your own voice. Um, so it's a much better idea to use a spatial directional feature for detection. Um, and also to get the robustness and the sound quality under control. Again, you're controlling another algorithm here, uh, co the compression system, to really mitigate uh, minor delays and potential misdetections. If you would directly decrease the gain um, and you would have a misdetection, it would sound, let's call it funny. Um, you will in next slide see we have application of a pretense system and the training in the field. Um, we are dynamically controlling a more involved algorithms and also the core hearing instrument, and we have rather fast impact. And to give you a glance what the spatial filters mean, so um, the idea is that you're taking the microphone signals, we are building multiple spatial filters, beamforming, um, one dedicated uh, null beamformer for your own voice. Um, and this uh, has to be trained uh, in the fitting session for yourself individually. And you have a null beam former for frontal targets. So this, of course, is the most challenged situation um, con comparing your own voice versus a frontal target. Um, again, it's a null beam former for frontal targets. It's, this can be pre-tained, what is good. Uh, it is device specific, but not person specific. But of course, you have also uh, further other means to get this thing running. You, you need the monorail beamformer to avoid false alarms for speakers from the back. You need the binaural beamformer, which is also quite important, um, to avoid false alarms for side speakers. Um, and you can use the binaural data exchange to exploit more features, uh, which have to be, uh, have to exploit the symmetry. Um, and consider also the noise floor to get this thing running. Um, as I told you, you need an individual on voice training, which has to be performed during the fitting. So when you are buying a hearing instrument at the acoustician, you're putting them on your ear and when the fitting session starts, it's adapted to you and to your hearing loss. Um, and here you would have to do this on voice training. So um, you're usually sitting here in a calm environment, counting from 21, 22, 23, around about 10 seconds. And in this time, when the filter is trained, um, the, the null beam former for your own voice. So what is done technically? In fact, a predictor is trained, which is predicting the front microphone signal based on the rear microphone. Um, there are also, so still classical methods, cross correlation, um, the lines using. Uh, and again, as I told you, we have to also be very careful if it's misused actually. So the convergence of this filter is checked against pre-recorded versions. So yeah, but you're pretty sure that this really worked, the training worked, um, and the person has trained the filter coefficients to him or herself. Okay. Honestly, I have no clue about the time, but I have one topic left, which you're, goes... You're fine on the time. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. <laughs> um, which goes really more and more um, in the direction of the talks I heard before, which I liked a lot. Um, of course, in some point of time, we are going to apply uh, to exploit the new methods of machine learning, also for hearing aids. And one of the most obvious um, algorithms would be the noise reduction. Um, so coming from the classical way of noise reduction, potentially Wiener filter based, um, you could also use other meth methods. Um, I, I saw the Wiener filter based method also in Carolina's slides. Um, you, you're running in a STFT domain Again, you have to be careful because uh, the number of filter bank, the frequency resolution has not to exceed a certain limit. Otherwise, uh, you are violating the latency restrictions. Um, often, noise reduction is Wiener filter based. It would require a good estimate of the signal and the noise PSD, power spectral density. Um, but this uh, Wiener filter based solution also gives you the advantage that it's easily adjustable. 
uh, meaning you can just say, okay, I have my gain and I just applied maximum of 10 dB and not more um, to really not suppress the noise to infinity so that we can still hear the footage. Um, but of course, usually these estimators, uh, especially the noise estimators, uh, they have certain drawbacks for in-stationary noise. And here the um, machine learning really could, uh, could help. It might overcome both limitations, um, meaning limited frequency resolution, um, which you would need, for instance, for, for speech to also um, uh, get the noise away in between the harmonics. And it might also be able to deal with in-stationary noise while still preserving the target speech. And of course, here the challenges are really the robustness and the sound quality. So a robustness, um, a typical example, you have trained your network uh, with a lot of speech, with a lot of noise, uh, and, and suddenly you're coming in with a multi-talker situation. You've never trained uh, double talk, double talk and babble noise, and uh, then it really gets messy. Um, of course, computational complexity is an issue. Um, so it might not be possible to have uh, networks of 10 million coefficients. Um, and we have to make sure that the complete system, including filter banks, um, has a, uh, is below a certain latency. I show you now one example, how one corporation we had with a university, how we dealt with this uh, issues. Um, Okay, I already talked about the robustness and sound quality. So somehow we need still need controllability. Um, we cannot just use the DNN and it will do its job and uh, we are out of the game. Uh, there also might be different requirements from different persons. So uh, there are also actually different uh, persons with uh, different habits and they still want to hear all the noise surrounding them and so not everybody is identical. Um, for to, to deal with the computational complexity, we uh, took a method where we still stayed within the filter bank domain, also to share the filter bank domain with already existing algorithms. Um, and we used audiological pre-knowledge, meaning different effects, which I already also somehow mentioned. So not directly doing it in one bunch, but trying to separate uh, the different effects. I will show you later. And of course, we have to reduce the number of frequency channels. As the filter bank was given, the neural network, which has to run in the subsample domain, had almost no or minor additional delay. And this is the definitely what I would call the third level of um, machine learning with direct impact on your audio signal and a very very, very low delay. Okay. So I can show you an example of a two-stage approach. I have a literature in on the last slide. So that you could even uh, read it. Um, so the first one is to, uh, our wish would be that we can deal with in-stationary signals. So, um, the first would be to estimate the optimum gains to enhance the spectral envelope for all frequency bands. So dealing with instationary noises and also with the instationarity of a speech. Um, but still in our frequency band domain. And the other one is to have a multi-tap complex filters for the low frequency bands uh, where we are really targeting to um, also damp the noise in between the harmonics. And you usually have to consider that also most kind of noises are somehow brownish. So you might have more noise in the low frequencies. And what we did here, so you have to consider we are in time frequency domain, STFT domain. So you have to certain time bins and frequency bins. Um, if you just apply one, so the simplest thing is to apply one gain. Uh, the, uh, already better is to apply a complex number if you have uh, in the filter bank domain usually dealing with complex numbers. Um, so 
already one complex number would be a filter complex mesh, uh, ratio mask, but you also can apply really deep filtering where you're considering a neighboring uh, coefficients in time, um, meaning you have a kind of FIR filter, finite impulse response in this complex domain, which allows you to have a higher frequency resolution later on. And you see here, um, we have given ourselves a restriction that we would tolerate one millisecond act, um, additional delay within the filter bank domain. Um, here you see the first example of how this was implemented. And this is also this two-stage approach where we really said we want to have dedicated uh, neural networks for the dedicated um, tasks. Um, Definitely so the stage one is working in a, a logarithmically scaled domain. So meaning um, subsampled bands. We are not taking every band, but kind of a bug scaled bands um, to keep it when close to, with our audiological pre-knowledge, we know that we need a higher frequency solution below frequencies for the perceived noise reduction. So we can uh, save more or less uh, computational complexity by uh, grouping bands together in the high frequency channels. Um, for the low frequency channels, we have the stage two where we're dealing with a periodicity of the signal and where we're really using uh, the complex features directly. Uh, the complete network has, uh, especially stage one, a unit-like uh, structure a convolutional encoder decoder structure where we have here also the decoder and the first stage would just produce gains. Again, better ones as the Wiener filter gains, but just gains. And the second stage is producing these filters I showed you. And when the filtering happens in the complex domain um, and actually the, the gains are applied third first and then the complete signal is filtered and we have it's on the next slide but we have certain our optimization criteria the loss function is designed in such a way that then again we can mix it with the original signal and this is definitely the mean to somehow deal with robustness and sound quality so we figured out that the complete network is usually trained to um, reduce the noise totally um, but later on, we are mixing it with the original signal to control the amount of noise reduction and also to control the sound quality. So we also, so at least in this um, corporation, we didn't succeed in have a complete artifact free um, neural network, uh, but it really turned out to be acceptable if you mix it with your original signal. Here, for instance, you can choose 10 dB noise reduction um, get your noise back a little bit. It's stamped, still audible, but the target signal is definitely um, higher in volume. And then the synthesis filter bank. Here's a little more detailed uh, picture. So we have a reduced DNN input with a bark like glucum of frequency bands to resemble somehow the auditory system. The loss function is it's actually multi-target. So we have uh, both uh, a function in magnitude um, and phase. Um, and also then later on to control the, um, the second stage, the filtering, um, we have a loss function in certain, in multiple frequency resolutions. So really later on the loss function includes another STS, STFT and then the loss function is evaluated in this STFT with a higher frequency resolution. Um, so in this example, complexity really got down below 1 million coefficients. So still a few hundred thousands coefficients, but it was okay, could be potentially possible in one of the future generations. Stefan, could I ask you to finish within the next three minutes or so? Yes, no problem. Thanks. So I just have the examples here. So applying the first uh, stage, um, you see that primarily um, 
the shape of the, the speech signal is enhanced. And with the ne next stage, which is only operating in the low frequencies, you see that we are also getting the noise down in between the harmonics. Okay. This was the literature I could highlight. And then I would be through with my presentation. Uh, and uh, I would be happy to hear some questions or I would be happy to answer them. Thank you very much indeed, Stefan. And thank you, Carolina, for that. So um, any questions for Carolina or Stefan? Questions or comments? Very welcome. I don't see any in the Q&A at the moment. Any hands? So Brian's, Brian's got his hand up, so I'll unmute Brian more so he can talk. Okay. Yeah, um, a, a question for Stefan. He, you talked about the problem of own voice perception and the way you described it, the abnormal perception of your own voice was, was coming from amplification of the acoustic path. But it's also the case that if you block the ear canal with a closed dome, you get an increase in bone conducted sound. Um, and if if the problem is that the balance between air, acoustic and bone conducted paths, then reducing the gain for the acoustic part will change that balance even more. So it's not obvious that it will improve sound quality. Um, uh, just by turning down the, the acoustic gain, because at least part of the problem is coming from an increase in bone conducted sound. That's right. So occ occlusion effect uh, you're referring to. Um, I have to remember. So talking to the colleagues uh, in the use cases we had uh, here tested, the occlusion effect was not the dominating one. Um, this definitely here also helps with. Um, with open domes. Okay, can I remember why the occlusion, occlusion effect was not the most critical one? I would have to come back to you. Mm -hmm. But it, it was okay, so the, the use cases where we are using the um, own voice processing um, did not really completely overlap with AOR systems, so active occlusion reduction systems. Um, but you're completely right, the occlusion effects exists. And um, if this uh, here, the red signal power is not flowing also outside of the ear, then you have um, much more this, this typical effect also if you press your fingers on the ear. Yeah, can I, can I ask a second uh, question? You, you talked about, uh, you use several different terms for the resolution in frequency that you were using to form frequency bands. So at one point you said log scaling, and then you said herb scaling, and then bark scaling, and they're each a bit different. And I, I wondered what, what you are actually using. Um, and related to that, if, if you've got greater resolution at low frequencies, does that imply a longer time delay at low frequencies? Okay, we are using um, ERP, ERP features. I just compared it to um, bark like grouping. Um, so I'm I'm sorry. So it's really just the frequency resolution. Um, we, good question with the filters. Uh, so we are actually only looking, it's FIR filters, and we mainly looking uh, in the time to the past. So we only allowed ourselves one millisecond uh, to the in the future so it uh, this version with deep filtering would actually increase the delay by one millisecond that's correctly okay. but you. otherwise yeah the the loss function is really uh, getting the signals phase exact so we are definitely won't have more delay than this one millisecond here Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael Agerroyd has his hand up. So, Michael, do you want um, to speak? I will delay my question because the question that's been asked in the question and answer is much more interesting than the one I was going to ask. Okay. So, we have a question in the Q&A which says, how do algorithms behave when hearing aid users don't fit their devices exactly in the same position each time? 
in a different location, angle against the head, tighter or looser against their ears, etc. Um, as those differences are very small millimeter wise, do they cause any meaningful differences to hearing? So that is a question for either one of you to take. Carolina, do you wanna say yeah, something? I, I can't say very much, but I can start and you can follow. I, I mean, this is the question of robustness that Stefan talked about. And, and I think that is always the case. If you know exactly how things are working from one time to the other, you can be very certain and you can also apply big differences between, for instance, your own voice and, and others' voices or when you are moving in different sort of environments. But uh, the, you have to, to sort of, uh, include uh, the, the differences that are, uh, naturally occur and exactly how that is done. I think Stefan is, is better to explain than I am. So in fact, this, this is an issue, especially when you have a prescribed uh, gain function, you won't fit it when you when it's not exactly in the same position. And this is really an effect going up to five, six, seven dB. Um, uh, Potentially even more severe um, is usually the acoustic feedback, um, but there we definitely have adaptive filters uh, running all, all the time online in the hearing aid. So we should somehow cope uh, with the thing, but what is currently not completely checked is really when the prescribed gain function. So if you're fitting your device more loosely, then you won't have less amplification and hopefully figure it out yourself and push it in more closer. Um, uh, hmm? Sorry. Okay, I think we'll move on, uh, which is to say we'll move back to Michael's hand in the air. Thank you, Graham. Um, I've got two questions if I'm allowed. First one to Stefan, my apologies if I missed it, but it's the subject of latency. Um, when you've built all these models and they're out in the hearing aids running in real life, are they effectively instantaneous when running or does it take a certain number of milliseconds for all the calculations to flow through the network? And that just cannot be reduced because a network takes a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if I get you com completely. So there is an algorithmic delay, uh, usually coming from the filter length and the filter bank. And uh, potentially there's also a, I uh, don't know, call it technical delay uh, be because you have a processor in and a processor can process all, all the stuff in real time. So um, it's not, not done all instantaneously. So the algorithmic delay is usually a bit in between six milliseconds and uh, 10 milliseconds, but the technical delay should be below one millisecond. Um, but this is so far. Did I somehow answer your question? I'm not quite sure. It is. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. And if I can ask, Ask one quick, quick question of Carolina. If you were designing a hearing aid to do conversations and to be like, you could sell it to somebody saying, this is ideal for conversations, how would you design it? I mean, that is a good question. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think one of the issues is exactly the one I just briefly mentioned. And that is that you can, increase your speech understanding for an identified talker in background noise by having something that is directional. Uh, but you don't want to have it so directional or you want it to be adaptive in a way so that you can also catch that now someone else will talk so that you can uh, pick up uh, a new conversation person or someone else talking. Um, and um, I think um, that is a challenge, uh, but an interesting one. Uh, that we, I mean, I think all hearing aid companies are currently working on. Okay, thanks. John Barker, you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, thanks. I've got a, a question for Stefan on the, the deep learning for uh, noise reduction. Mm -hmm. so, so in Clarity, we've been using kind of simulation so that we've got matched pairs of the noisy signal and the clean reference signal that we can denoise to. That leads to the kind of problem that in real listening, you know, that simulation might be oversimplistic and we haven't got a lot of the effects that happen in the real acoustic environment. Um, is there a better way of doing this? I mean, how, how do we simulate signals that are sufficiently close to real? Or do we have to have to use real signals and somehow capture the, the clean signal through some that's, technique? 
This is a very good question. So for instance, you're missing the Lombard effect. So when it's getting loud, a bad SNR, you are usually raising your voice or um, sounds different. Um, Honestly, I think we have to do the same. What what we usually do, so in, in the training phase, you, you do it exactly like you do, but potentially when in a testing phase, you also include when really signals recording in real life, or we definitely also test in real life. So right. I would say you, you cannot solve the issue for the training because you, you need both separated, at least for neural networks. Um, honestly, we had this just recently for wind noise. It's not when you can can just add wind and speech. It doesn't work. <laughs> it's, it's something different. That you really have speech in a wind system. If this is as you, you cannot just add them together. You have a speech signal and a wind signal and you add them and then you can test your wind noise cancel. No, it doesn't work. So it's really a very good question. So, so there's a number of things in the simulation, like the wind noise and the Lombard effect. So of all these things, which, you know, there's, there's motion as well and movement of sources, which are the, the most important to get right in the simulation then, do you think? Uh, you point out a good, did I get it right? So uh, the moving right. of sources, yeah. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, you know, if we had to kind of go to our next challenge and we wanted to kind of improve our you know, validity by having kind of better simulation, what things are we kind of, you know, what would the priorities there? Because at the moment we've got these quite artificial head turns, we've got, you know, a number of point sources in a mm -hmm. quite simple acoustic environment. Um, I think this is pretty important. <laughs> yeah, the Lombard effect is just... right. I will aside notice. Uh, definitely uh, rotating your head and potentially also moving sources uh, might be much more important. That's right. This, this really pays to the robustness issue. You cannot guarantee that the person is not rotating its head and still wants to listen uh, to a certain talkers here. Yeah. Right. yeah, thanks. I would like to break in at this point uh, because we um, uh, would like to use the time that we have left up to the break to uh, move further in the direction that John Barker's question was, was pushing us, which is to do with where do we go next? And so I like Trevor has something to say here, if we could use that time that way. I'm sorry, Brian, I know your hand's been up for a while, but uh, maybe what you have to say will also be relevant here. Yeah, so we're looking at what we're doing going forward in Clarity about trying to make our tests our simulations, our evaluation data sets, the way we set the rules, more ecologically valid. Hence, why well, we've just had that great talk from Carolina and Stefan pointing out the issues and many things that we haven't dealt with properly. Now, I've just put in the chat, and I'll also share screens and show it to you, um, a link to a Padlet um, where you can actually see here, I've set up a few questions. It's very easy to use here. You just literally click on the plus button and add your own comment in there. For whatever you want to do and what we're trying to get at is how essentially what can we do to make the next enhancement challenge more ecologically valid the first column is for you to write well what did what do you think we missed out on before which might inform that and then these other columns are about trying to look at well, what future scenarios should we look at we're stuck within the domestic environment we're thinking of going outdoors next is that the right movement um, and also how we can improve the, ch the challenges for competitors to actually make it better for those who take part, how we might improve the stimuli, you know, actually make these signals in some way more ecologically valid. And of course, we're running listening tests, and as Car Carolina kind of implied, I mean, our listening tests are fairly straightforward speech and noise tests, which are not kind of like one of those fancy cocktail parties. So there's a whole set of questions. So what would be really nice is if you, you kind of would, would fill that in, um, and but we'll come back to keep having a conversation at the site, same time. So uh, feel free to go to it. Uh, the link, as I said, was in, and I'll give you a QR code as well. And uh, we can then sort of kind of look at how we can make uh, clarity even better in the kind of future rounds. So thanks, Trevor. Would I be right in thinking that Padlet is going to be open for the rest of the day? Yeah, that's the idea. So um, you just go to the link I just stuck in the chat 
we'll just leave it all open. I'll put, I mean, we'll leave it open for sort of kind of a couple of days, but yeah. it'll be great. I, I strongly suggest everyone has a lunch break, but you know, if thoughts come to you over lunch, you quickly put them in when you come back or during the afternoon session. Yeah. Okay, good. So I would strongly encourage people to go in there and just uh, comment and add ideas in there because those are the kinds of things we need uh, to help us work out what to do next time round. Um, so we still have some time to be talking to each other. So I'm going to let Brian actually say something now. Brian, thanks. Yeah, this is addressed to Stefan again. Um, you, I, I internally agree that you don't want to entirely remove the background sounds. The, the user of hearing aids needs to have some situational awareness. They need to know what's going on around. But you, you dealt with this by adding some of the original speech in background sounds to the processed uh, speech in background sounds. Uh, but the network itself was trained on the clean speech, as I understand it. The target for the network is to remove the noise entirely, and then you add some noise back. Don't you think it would be better to have as a training target the speech in noise, but with the signal to noise ratio increased? So you're training the network to improve the signal to noise ratio, but not to remove the noise entirely. This is a pretty good uh, proposal. Um, we discussed it back and forth, and I don't know if we finally... So the guy said um, it's easier for the network to reduce the noise completely, so it converges faster. Um, and so we we trained to removing noise completely rather than training to remove it, for instance, by 20 dB. Um, you are completely right. You could have the situation that your the speech signal, of course, we have a loss function, so it has to be exact in phase and amplitude. Um, but for the noise signal, we don't have a kind of a loss function which would later on guarantee that uh, summing it up with the original signal uh, sounds very good but at least it was sufficient let's call it this way i hope i could answer your question but i think it's an open open point yeah, here. yeah. i think it's certainly worth exploring what gives the best sound quality in the end training mm -hmm to improve the speech to noise ratio or training to make it completely clean and then in, adding some of the background in. And my intuition is better to train on what you want to achieve in the end, which is to improve the signal to noise ratio. And I think that that's one of the main ways in which the first challenges were unrealistic because everyone was aiming to completely remove the background noise, which is not what hearing aid users want. Mm. Okay, yep. thanks, Brian. Um, I think, John Barker, you still have your hand up. Is that because you want to say something or because you've forgotten to take it down? No, it's because I didn't know how to take uh, it down. Uh, Carolina had something to say. You're muted. I now saw that. Uh, I have just one comment uh, related to the testing, and, and it's actually something that sparked us to look into these common sound scenarios, because when we are developing features for certain situations, and in particular the very difficult situations, it is very important to keep checking that the hearing aids sound fine also in the easier situations that are much more common. And it's related to the sort of robustness that Stefan talked about, that the hearing aids need to sound good in in also the easier situations and give the help required in the difficult ones. And I'm thinking that that could also be something that, I mean, could be part of the testing actually, to say that, okay, this is the difficult situation that we are focusing on, but maybe we also need to see how it sounds in, in, uh, in easier situations. So now John again. Oh, I do have a question now. <laughs> Um, is there any demand at all for like what you might call some sort of high intelligibility mode where you would actually sacrifice quality for intelligibility for specific situations? So say someone's trying to kind of understand a credit card number over a phone or listening to a particular announcement where, you know, although they wouldn't tolerate distortion to the speech in the hearing aid generally, for this short period, you know, they are super focused and actually understanding what's been said and would 
tolerate some distortion. So like a button you might press or a mode you might activate for this. Is there any demand for that at all or any interest in that? Do you want to answer Stefano? Should I say something? I think you can. I mean, we have we have uh, uh, we have played with the idea to have something we could call extreme features that doesn't sound good, but they are helping in certain situations. I think it's fair to say that we haven't dared to implement it in in a sort of regular hearing aids just yet. But it's a, it's a good idea, and it's uh, something that we have uh, tried out. Okay. Um, I have a question for you, Stefan. Um, with the system that you described that you have developed in collaboration um, with academia, how do you think that would have performed in any of our challenges? Oh, it's hard for me. <laughs> Uh, it wasn't intended to be an easy question, but I'm just uh, thinking you, you must have thought about how does that system sort of contrast with the systems we've heard about? Um, and what is your sort of intuitive feeling for where yours would score well uh, or not against the other ones? I can just give you a feeling. I think it would score decent, but or okay, okay -ish. Um, but we really also had when we cite conditions where we really restricted uh, restricted the performance of a noise reduction on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think we would have to recheck this here. <laughs> um, we're running slightly over time. What do the chairpersons wish to do at this point? I think it's important we have lunch. Yeah. <laughs> Because those uh, of us who are for whom it is lunchtime, yes. Well, okay. even if it's not lunchtime, I think making sure that we're not exhausting people by just talking through the break. Okay, good. Well, we will stop then now and return at uh, one o'clock UK time. Uh, the Padlet will be open throughout, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all back again in a little while. Thanks very much. Thank you again to Carolina and Stefan. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You're welcome. Thanks. You're welcome.